Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Uh, today's event is called What Just Happened? Looking back at a semester with AI in our classrooms. I'm Dr. DJ Hopkins. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a professor in the School of Theater, Television, and Film, and I'm the director of the SDSU Center for Teaching and Learning. And it's a pleasure, thank you, Sean on the CTL Advisory Board. It's a pleasure to be having this conversation with all of you today, part of a conversation I've been having since before the semester began about AI in the classroom, whether it's been showing up to meet the provosts and the provosts and deans, or hosting a faculty learning community, hosting a podcast. So it's been a conversation I've been having in a number of contexts with some of the people in this room on several occasions. I also want to give a shout out to my colleague, Dr. Pam Lack, who has been hosting the AI in the Classroom Faculty Learning Community in the Digital Humanities Center all semester long. Thank you so much. And also, I just want to thank you, Scott, because I think you've earned a free sandwich. You've been here. Dr. Scott Lipscomb has gone three for three on oh, Lunch and Learn for Thank you. I'm a musician. Like a free <laughs> Before we really get started, SDSU's land acknowledgement. For millennia, the Kumeyaay people have been a part of this land. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the San Diego State community, we acknowledge this legacy. Although the semester isn't over yet, this conversation is kind of a premature retrospective on the first semester that we knew was going to be heavily impacted by generative AI applications. And um, the panelists that we're speaking with today, each of whom, each will share a, a brief anecdote from their own experience in the classroom, followed by our colleague EJ Sobo, who's going to find the golden thread that runs through these anecdotes and synthesize before we turn over to you, who will ask questions of our guests and maybe even share some of your own experiences teaching with AI. First, our panelists, Katie Hughes. Katie has been teaching rhetoric and writing at SDSU for over 20 years. She has an extensive background in designing courses that integrate instructional technologies and pedagogical strategies with an emphasis on active learning. She is also currently the faculty in residence for ITS. Sam Kobari has been a lecturer in the anthropology department for over 10 years. In this time, Sam has integrated a variety of technologies into his classes to enhance the learning experience for his students. Uh, and our respondent, E.J. Sobo, is a professor in SDSU's Department of Anthropology, the director for undergraduate research in the College of Arts and Letters, and one of two AI faculty fellows with instructional technologies. So, welcome panelists, and uh, Katie. Katie will be beginning. Do you want the gadget, or do you want me to run your slides? No, I have to, because it's... It would be too boring without my hand making exactly. Let me slip past you and get out. Okay, so um, as you can see, and he said, I, I teach writing uh, and have taught writing for many years here. So uh, my focus is uh, on using it as a writing uh, instruction tool, or actually for my students to use it um, in their in their process of writing. So, <clears throat> my general approach, basically, and I just. Uh, heard students from, was that the Associated Students, CJ? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, the president and the vice president talk about what students want, and I'm really happy because <laughs> I give them what they want. <laughs> I didn't know that. Uh, but it's so, I, I feel confident that I'm on the right track. I'm focusing on process always over product. So um, it isn't uh, a piece of writing, it's getting to that piece of writing, and that's where AI can, uh, and, and to be honest, I'm super uh, unsophisticated. It's the, the free chat GPT. When I say AI, that's what I mean. Um, I'm not getting into anything fancy at all. Um, so if you focus on the process, it can be an interesting experience. I'm an active participant in that experience. So I'm talking about face-to-face -face teaching here. I will talk about online also in a minute. But um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm part of that process with them. I'm very hands-on, and I want to know what they're doing. I want to see what happens. I want to learn from it, because I, I don't know. I'm no expert, right? So that's been my sort of general approach. Um, spontaneity is really important. I will just, we'll be working on something, and I might see, oh, this might be a good time to try that GPT. Let's see what it will do. Um, so it's not always planned. I have some planned things, but it's kind of a super loose and open situation. And um, along those lines, just ex encouraging experimentation, um, analyzing what it comes up with, not just like, oh, I did this, now I'm done with that. Uh, no, what did you get? Was it any good? Um, what would you want to do to make it better for it to be more your own thing? So um, there is a very big difference, though, in this approach <laughs> with face-to-face -face versus online, because mm. you cannot be right there. You can't be hands-on, you can't be participating with them in the process. So that this is the area that I'm concerned with trying to work more on how can I make it work better. Um, and I'm not there yet by any means. So here's my, my cheesy metaphor. <laughs> I told Andrea about this. Uh, it, I consider it, it's play. It's playful. We're mm -hmm. not we're not getting intense here. So you start by serving that ball. <laughs> which is the prompt to chat GPT. See what it returns. Hit it back. In other words, refine it. See more. This process is so important because what they're doing is figuring out what they even want. So the outcomes that they are seeking, they get clarity on with the, the wrong results or the kind of off results that chat GPT might give them. It's like, no, that's not what I wanted. Well, what do you want? And, and this really slows down that whole process better than me telling them what they should do, and and so on. So it, it's a it's a back and forth kind of situation. So important thing, and the students, uh, the AS students, just reinforce this. Students just want to know, like, what do you? How should I use this? What do you want from me? What don't you want from me? What's what are the rules? So I do have some stuff on my syllabus about it, um, reminding them. These are tools. Uh, it's, it's, it's not your personal assistant who's going to write things for you. There are acceptable ways to uh -huh. use this. So I list what those are. Basically brainstorming, um, editing for errors, and concision. I teach business writing mostly. Um, it's really important, <laughs> being concise. And a lot of times they're just like, ah, they've written this long thing. I wanted just a short thing. I don't know how to make it more concise. Let's see what ChatGPT does with it. Because they've already got the, the content. Mm -hmm. And so it shows them how those words can be gotten rid of. OK. Also, unacceptable ways. Important. So I want them to understand what I would not consider OK. And um, this, this part is basically, you, go ahead, use it. You won't get a good grade. That's what I'm basically saying. Because it's a, it's a crummy writer mm -hmm. in and of itself until you work with it so much to get it just how you want it, and then that means you've just you've basically written it. So. And don't use it for research, because uh, as we all know, it's, it's not reliable. So, And I'm not going to sit there and, and check all their sources. So here's just one little tiny example. Um, these things happen a lot in my class. But they have to do an email where they include a bullet list. I know that sounds really basic. <laughs> Uh, but hey, can you get better emails after my students? Um, <laughs> so they start off with a backdrop of you know how to do a bullet list, how to how use parallel structure, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then they read an article about ChatGPT disrupting business uh, processes. This is in the Harvard um, Business Review. I, I'm going to have to keep changing this article assignment because it will keep evolving. But for now, that one works. And um, then they take a pop quiz. I, it's a joke. My joke that it's a pop quiz because they already know it's going to happen. Um, but it's basically in the classroom so that they can do something with what they read, which is my way of making them read it at home. Um, in their groups, they discuss the pop quiz answers. And then they share something with the class selectively. And ultimately, a few more steps down the road, they, they write that email with that bullet list, hopefully in a more process-based way. The pop quiz questions are not knowledge-based. They're more about 
um, playing around with it. So I make them find a sentence that they already wrote in a different assignment, um, and then feed it to ChatGPT and ask it to put a bullet list. And I already know this is a faulty prompt, but I want them to go through that um, experience of writing a not complete prompt. So of course, you know, there's mixed results there. And then I ask them, so was it good? Did, did, it, did it use parallel structure? Did it, uh, you know, do all the things we've talked about? And a lot of times it doesn't unless they thought to put that into the prompt. So that, that's where they get clarity. Um, so then I have them analyze it, and this is what they talk about in their groups, um, and they have to explain. And finally, as, you know, evaluate it. Was, is this going to be useful or not? Um, basically, most of them are, are pretty enthusiastic about using it. Um, some are just like, eh, yeah, I'd rather just write my stuff. <laughs> But you'll see in a minute. Most people are, are pretty excited about it. So this is just one section of one, you know, I teach multiple sections, but um, it was pretty overwhelming that they, they could see it being useful. These are sophomores, by the way. So this is kind of newer for them, not more sophisticated. Um, the online students, the, the problem there, as I said, is that you can't be hands-on with them by the very virtue of the fact that <laughs> There's, who knows where they are. Um, so it's, they tend to be more product focused and they're looking how to, how to get that piece of writing um, done and I've given them permission to use chat GPT so imagine the results, you know. Um, so the less hands on I am, the less successful the results are in that. Um, I, I make suggestions, you know, like, you know, take ownership, integrate this into your piece of writing. So then you get like a paragraph by chat GPT and a paragraph by them, and it's like, no. Um, so that's lazy integration. It, it, it creates bad writing. I don't have to worry about, oh, you cheated, because um, it's bad. <laughs> so I can just base the grade on that. Um, proper use, on the other hand, some people do uh, get more sophisticated with it, and they, they can come up with some pretty good writing. So it, it has its results. Uh, but I do want to emphasize, it, it's not about cheating. Um, and the, the same students that I just heard a few minutes ago were saying that there's so much, um, kind of, not resentment, but they feel a little put upon by the attitude that a lot of professors have that everybody's cheating. You know, that, that's like the default. So I like to just say, look, if it's a bad piece of writing, I don't care if you wrote it or ChatGPT wrote it, it's not going to get a good grade. And that sort of takes away that part of it. Student feedback. I really was pleased. Um, they do reflections at the end of modules. Um, some of the things they pulled out of it made me happy that they want to learn how to avoid cliches and bad, you know, robot wording. Um, and how they were grateful that it gave them a chance to um, see what this is all about, basically, in a non-pressure way. And that, you know, we do a lot of things in the module. This person was said, saying my biggest takeaway was how to work with chat GPT, which they call chat GPT. <laughs> That's a weird word. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I would say, back to my metaphor. Um, <laughs> you know, why not go with it and, and try to make it work for you? And, and that's my, my song and dance on it for now. Mm -hmm. if it's you out. Yeah. Question for you. Yeah. So, do, do you do you have them turn them in and turn them in these papers? In turn it in. Turn turn it in. in yeah. Um, it depends on the assignment. Um, but but when, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, but does turn, turn it in. Catch? No, turn it in has a tool for detecting um, AI that we don't use here because it's it's got too many false uh, positives, so to speak. It's okay. not accurate. No. Yeah. There's no detection tool that works. Uh, reliably for that. Right. Thank, oh, thanks, nice. Katie. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you were to take a look at CTL's AI in the Classroom module on Canvas, there's uh, an entry for AI detectors. Uh, a numerical majority of CSU campuses have the Turnitin.com AI detector turned off. And that was the discussion that uh, CTL and ITS had before the semester started. Yeah. AI detectors are biased. They're just mm -hmm. as prone to hallucination as regular AI generators. And bias. 
And, and they're there's biased against English language learners in particular, yeah. and there's, yeah. there's data on that. Yeah. I'm happy to pick that thread up in a moment. Katie, thank you so much. No As a reminder, uh, EJ is going to be synthesizing our two presentations, and our second presenter is Sam Kobari. Oh, hi. She's going to check out. Do you want to plug in that for Do you want to just uh, grab this and put it on your computer? Oh, I grab that. Sure. Oh, it's a map. Yeah. Uh, right. You're covered. You're off. <laughs> I want to see some of these limbo holders. Because yeah. everybody's bending down. I want to see this. So, doing it in a more festive way. DJ, we want to see your limbo under the camera. No, I, I'm just sort of. I see the crawling under. That's less impressive. Thanks. Pretty flexible, though. All right, I'll just start with the song. I'll plug it in a second. Uh, so I'm going to, I guess, kind of echo maybe overlap a little bit. Uh, uh, so I teach a large, a fairly large online class, uh, asynchronous online class. One of the uh, main assignments of my online class was a research paper where they had to pick any topic in anthropology, which I keep it kind of broad, and be able to do academic peer-reviewed research, which made this paper ripe for AI, uh, just going after it. So. Um, it's actually inspired after I heard a little NPR uh, bit about a kid from Cornell that really was talking about how he could go around AI and cheat, and this is the method he does for cheating. So I took his method and I made it into an assignment. <laughs> uh, and uh, this assignment is, uh, I, I kind of beta tested it in my summer uh, online class, and uh, to great success. I'm working at the Kings because now it's a larger group, but. Uh, I'm doing very much the same thing, this dialogue, uh, this process. So uh, the, I split the assignment up into where I'm having students have a dialogue with AI in establishing, kind of figuring out what they want to write about. Um, I'm looking where anthropology, we kind of got our fingers and everything so they can kind of introduce whatever they're interested in with anthropology and then see what topics come up. And I just want to give you an example of how this works. Um, the AI I prefer to use is called perplexity. Up until last week, I felt like it was, last week, um, Sam Altman had a whole presentation, which I'll get into just a second, about the new chat GPT, which is super exciting. But um, I like perplexity because it, per it gives you where it's getting its sources from, and it's connected to the internet. Chat GPT used to cut out at 2020. Um, so let me just show you uh, one of the things. So, uh, uh, and I have students uh, a list of very similar to but the list of questions that they ask AI, and they have this dialogue back and forth, and then kind of establish a structure for their paper, which they then go in and go out. So I've already kind of set this up. I'm in injecting my own bias into this. Um, I surf. So uh, it's just basically kind of a, I need to write a paper for my anthropology 101 class. Can you give me five topics that have to do with anthropology and surfing? So something that's interesting like that. Uh, and then. <laughs> so right away it gives me, and, and just, just to let you know little things I'm coming across, is the answer is sometimes a little too complex for Anthro 101 class. So they're looking at this like anthropology serving communities, but you can, I'm, I'm very much encouraging students to have this dialogue, just like the tennis uh, metaphor. So um, I can say, um, can you please... So this this dialogue keeps going. Um, I further have students, despite the loose fish, I have them. Like, I could ask them. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll stop being. I, I can't. I have to be polite. <laughs> <laughs> Does that affect the answer? I know. I don't know. Yeah. It's curious. <laughs> Sam, I'm sorry, what was the initial prompt I was doing? I think. Uh, topics on anthropology and surfing. Thank you. So 
Now I'm asking them for five peer reviewed sources. Right. Now here's the here's the fun part is the hallucinations do happen. So I'm having the students take these sources and then using our SDSU library database and playing with these hallucinations and then and then going further. And it's been it's been delightful because I've had students that like interested in fashion and so they're fashion and anthropology and how that works together, or students interested in food and everything. Everything they want to do, they're able to combine with anthropology. So this is one way I've been using it. i and it's it's been fun. Uh, students are having a little, it, I'm actually surprised at how little students are using AI, so how much they're kind of discovering AI through this process. Um, that's one way I'm using it. Another way I'm using it is I have uh, a portion of my class I call, uh, it's basically essay questions on the material. And sometimes the material can be a little dense, so I have students be able to kind of, for one of these weeks of essay questions, I call it AI concept enhancement, where they get to ask AI about a certain concept. So if I was to, uh, let me just do it again. So, um, please. <laughs> again, please. <laughs> Explain. Uh, no, uh, they're trying to, yeah, the teaching the AI politeness, yeah. Uh, uh, please uh, explain. <laughs> and so for one of these, and it does a fantastic job with these. The explanation of concepts and then narrowing that, especially that like I am five, really works out. So it's, there it is, variation, inheritance, selection, time. So it breaks it down. So a concept that students don't understand, instead of forcing them to write an essay question, I have them do this, paste this over, and then tell me how this help them understand that concept. Mm -hmm. And it's been really cool. So th these two components in my class have been, uh, I feel very successful. I'm surprised how little students have used this. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're not reading the syllabus, which is not a shocker there. But, uh, and uh, I guess the last thing I, I want, um, so Sam Altman had a presentation, I'm sure, the, uh, last week on the new chat GPT. Um, and what they're doing, as I'm super excited about, I can't wait to integrate this, is they're having something called GPTs, which is program this, but you can program it with your own information. So I can start a blank GPT, give it my textbook, give it my syllabus, give it all the textbooks in anthropology, and then it could be like a little assistant, where students ask it, like, how many pages, how many how many words on the, on the uh, research paper? I know, like, the research paper is this many pages. Can I have it in MLA form? No, it should be in Chicago. So it can be my Anthro 101 assistant, which would cut the 15 repetitive questions I get in a semester down by the way. And, yeah, so these are, these are the fun, uh, fun things I've been doing with the class. I'm, the papers do this Friday, so I'm, I'm, I'm really <laughs> curious to see how, this, how it turns out. So this is your first time of doing it. Summer. I did it. I did it oh, summer, summer, but summer was a lot smaller. Right, this is right. this is the bigger group. I, all the questions are coming in, and a lot of them, a lot of students are. I'm sure you, you might be doing that. This is. I, I thought I was way behind my students on this, but a lot of them were like, "What is this? I don't know how to use this. So what's going on?" So yeah, it, yeah. It, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Sam, thank you. Yeah. Well, Yeah, God, I don't, you guys said it all, I'm too really to say anything, uh, because what you both, what you both focus on, excuse me, I'm just going to try and escape from this. Could you get locked I started to make notes, and then I just thought, what's the point? Process, participate, play, product, no, product, no, and both of your presentations focus on the activity of learning. So all I could think about is a book. If you give your students a book and say, read this book, and they give them a test, or have them write a paper, without any conversation, is it gonna work? Yeah, for some people, maybe. But that's not teaching, and that's not gonna be teaching and learning that we at SDSU you know, wanna do. That kind of stuff is not what we're here for. So this tool, like any tool, like a book, like, um, I'm looking at the anthro people, like some bones you give your students. <laughs> you have to talk about it. You have to participate. You have to play. The process is so much more important than the product. And it's kind of interesting how did it take 
the rise of these chatbots to remind us what we're here for? <laughs> How did yeah. that even happen? So I think that's the, that's the golden thread, really, right. here behind everything. Um, so of the people in this room, I mean, I see a lot of familiar places. Is there anybody who, who really came because you never used it and you don't, you've never, ever tried? Or Okay, so we do have a, a few people who've never tried it. What kept you away? I don't think it. I don't, I don't think it has value for my. I, I teach theater, so okay. I don't think it's gonna. I, I have plenty of stuff to do, and I don't teach writing. So, <laughs> so, yeah. that's been a for so me. why are you here? <laughs> the lunch isn't that good. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'm just I'm okay. Because this is kind of the same thing. It's like, oh, it's not for me. I get by without it. I don't really need it. I don't really use it. But it's got, it's here, right? Mm -hmm. And so how do we think creatively about, even in a, in a theater or a class, maybe for uh, interrogating a play that you want the students to learn about? Was that dramaturgy? Mm -hmm. Dr yeah, or script analysis. Script analysis, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. I like to think of these text bots or chat bots. I, I like your five, like my five-year-old, explain it to me like a five-year-old and how can really simplify and explain. But it also is kind of like, it's your assistant. You can use it for your own work. For um, if, you're, if you're stuck with a huge class and you need to generate a bunch of multiple guest questions, you could use it for that. You could use it for formatting tables. You could use it for all kinds of things. Um, but thinking about how to ask it questions. So the learning of how to speak with these chatbots is in itself um, a skill, right? And in, maybe I should mention, the, the student survey, the AI survey that students entered, you might be familiar with that. One, one really amazing thing is was the, the response rate was just more than we could ever have imagined, indicating that students really are interested in this. About half of them have used it. But going back to how well they've used it, maybe not so well. Just like the first time if you ever put the first time you ever open the chat GPT, you just you don't know how to ask it a question. And then it doesn't give you something and then you just give up. So so in the student feedback, one of the things that some um, there's seven thousand and something um, answers. And we did ask for some narrative qualitative stuff not really realizing that we could. But so this is preliminary. We haven't, I haven't read all 700 whatever. But the idea that in questioning it, it this um, I remember one very vividly that they learned how to ask better questions. Learning how to ask better questions, isn't that what we're here to help cultivate in students? So, I mean, it does take time. And then one number I've heard is it takes 10 hours sitting with any of these particular things to really figure out how it works and so forth. But once you figure out how it works, it really can give a lot of advantages. There are a lot of disadvantages, too. There's a lot of ethical issues and so forth. I'm thinking about your assistant that you now have. Well, what TA is that put out of work or, you know, what have you. So as part hand in hand with this survey that we've done, which probably some of the results will be rolled out and shared with the, the faculty at large <coughs> shortly. Um, not tomorrow, <laughs> because there's a lot to, to go through. But um, students were concerned about the pervasive stereotype that we carry of students, or not us in this room, of course, but generally, that they're going to cheat. What is that about? Why do we do that? Why do we immediately follow them around the shop thinking they're going to steal? Right? There's something going on there that we need to stop doing because our relationship with students is not helped by that kind of a perspective. And students feel it and they resent it and it's insulting to them. So that's one of the things that came out. A lot of the things that came out we're building into, I'm kind of doing a, 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 a strange segue here to an AI micro-credential that will be available to faculty probably by, the, certainly by the start of spring term. Working on it, trying to get that up um, and trying to stay ahead of all these advances like now the GPT, that oh gosh, we're putting that there too and so forth. But get that out and that will have a section that will just like, what is, what does GPT even stand for? How does it work? Once you understand a little bit about how it works, then you start to understand better how to manage it and how to manipulate it and how to work with it. 
So how does it work? Um, I'll just say quickly here that there's the text ones, but there's image ones too, and they work slightly differently. And each different discipline, and even within each different discipline, different classes are gonna have different uses, right? So there's no across the board solution. <clears throat> so that's the first module, is just an overview. How does it work? Um, and then there'll be an ethics module, speaking even to issues such as social justice. And um, someone mentioned, one of you two mentioned the bias, or maybe you mentioned the bias. Sometimes that comes out, oh, it was when the plagiarism detection yeah. came up. Mm -hmm. that, that there's bias in that regard, but there's also bias in, you might say, um, I'm, I'm a 13-year-old girl from Cleveland, Ohio. What's a good job for me? And then, because it's trained on the garbage that society, sorry, it's trained on the, everything that human beings content, content it's going to maybe make some suggestions that aren't exactly fair and equitable and so forth. So, uh, another thing maybe just to pop in here is that when we want to train it to not put um, pornographic or racist or whatever things out there, somebody has to do that training. Who does that training? People sitting in sweatshops being exposed to those toxic photographs, right? There's all kinds of issues. That's module two. <laughs> and I should say here, the whole thing's going to take um, no more than four hours. And you can do it in two hours if you don't want to get your little badge of micro credentials. So we're going to do that. Or not. We're going to do demos showing people what are some of the various kinds perplexity, Claude, um, Bing has one, ChatGTP, of course, which now goes up to 2023, April 2023. Um, so there'll be demos. And then in the end, the student, us, whoever takes the micro-credential will get to choose a sort of tailored set of the apps that really makes the most sense for me to, in my theater class. What makes sense for me? Does um, image generation? No, but this one that's all about whatever might make more sense for you. And then learning about how to optimize those prompts to get what you need out of it. So that's coming, um, but I think getting back to what you guys were talking about really is this focus on process. And again, going back to that old example of a book, you don't just give a book and then just have um, a, a, a data dump at the end where the student spits out a paper. That's not teaching and learning. That's not what college is for. And it's the same kind of thing with these chatbots. So we want to help our students to understand, this is a helper. This is like my little brother or my grandma or my uncle. Um, but they're going to sometimes say wrong things, and I need to understand that it doesn't, it's not God, right? It's not omniscient. And so when we can help them to understand how to best use it, we are really setting them up for the future because as the student said in the session that Kitty and I were in beforehand, this is what students are thinking about when they go to college. How can we get the training we need to be, get successful careers and meaningful careers or whatever you want to call jobs? They're gonna, they know they're going to need to understand how this AI stuff works. Mm -hmm. So we can't just stick our heads in the sand and say, oh, well, it's not important in my, it, yeah. And I'm reminded to, I'll just say one more thing. And because the, the, the president of our AS mentioned that he had taken a class that I teach, Anthropology 402. And I remember way back when, sitting in the class, we were talking about revolution, sort of um, Copernican revolution, whatever revolution. I said, what's the next revolution, kids? And someone in the back said, and I said, what? Can you say that again? And he said, smartphone. And I said, what? He said, smartphone, the smartphone. And I couldn't even wrap my head around what that was. I couldn't recognize the word because it was so foreign. This was 2006, spring 2006. So I'll leave you with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, BJ. Questions, questions for comments our from you, for our presenters, for EJ. Yes, Laura. I just want to say a comment. Um, it reminds me, back in 1996, I took a class through Chicano Federation where they taught us about the internet. And they sat us in front of a computer and they said, this is the internet, you can look, what I, look up whatever you want. And I, I was like, I don't know what I want to look for. I don't know how to use this. Right. And so that's kind of how I'm feeling right now. <laughs> I'm not too sure how to use this right now, but I want to use it in my class. I'm excited to do it. Yeah. But yeah, that's kind of how I'm feeling. I'm not yeah, too sure. so you can't just brainstorm. You can even ask it. 
if um, I teach whatever at whatever level, give me some suggestions as to how I can use mm -hmm. you. <laughs> what is your discipline? I teach with general studies class, um, building your future self for college success and beyond. Okay. So it's all about a uh, personal development course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that it, it or we can make suggestions as to how like how it can and it can ask you can program it to ask students questions. It can actually interrogate the student. So it can lead the student on kind of a reflexive journey about, I'm just thinking about what you want to do when yeah. you grow up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you can, you can, you can get in the back side there. It's the GPT that Sam was talking about, but even in just regular free chat GPT, if you open up the settings, I'm sorry, I should stand up here. Mm -hmm. you, you open up the settings, no, 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 no. and um, you can tell it a persona, and you can tell it how you want it to, if you want it to be, um, speak formally to the students, speak casually, speak in Gen Z language, or Gen whatever the next Gen is, mm -hmm. and you can tell it who you are. So mm -hmm. there's two, two boxes and say, I am this, I teach this, I that, and, and so forth, so that it can, so you're, pre, you're pre-training it, kind of like that. And then as you set it up, you can feed it up stuff, and then and you can work on creating prompts that you can then give your students, right? But with the GPT, it's gonna be even better, because then it's, it's all that pre-training, and then you just give them the app. Like on your phone right now, do you have any apps on your phone? Yeah. Like what, what's an example of an app that you have? Probably for a hobby or something? Spotify. Okay, Spotify. Well, um, who has any weird hobby apps that you have? <laughs> what is this? Oh, yeah. Oh, right, right. Let's <laughs> <laughs> get personal about this, right? And so that's already been uploaded with all the stuff, right? There's so so you're giving them one for self-reflective journey on meaningful careers that already is maybe uploaded with certain kinds of things. I want to add to that is that um, when I first, as soon as it came out, I wanted to do something with it. But I had absolutely no idea, just like you were saying. It's like the internet, oh, what do I do? Uh, students, I told them, hey, this new thing is here. I don't know how to use it. Let's let's figure, let's figure, play around with it. What do you think would be interesting uh, with whatever we happen to be doing at that time? Um, and they, they were just amazing. You know, like I said, some of them were completely like meh. Uh, but a lot of them, just like all of a sudden, they're like finding out all this stuff, so I was, it's the old, you know, cliche. I learned from my students. But I really did. You know, they gave me play. good stuff. Play. Play. Yeah, it's just, and there was just no stakes. No, nobody's losing points or gaining points or cheating or not cheating. It was just right. like, let's just see what happens. EJ, let's get yeah. some more voices in here. Right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I, I was trying to ask some of the uh, audience members. Oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, Aaron. I have a question. Um, so I'm curious if there's been discussion about differential use at different levels of students. So for instance, you know, um, undergrads, I, I suspect that maybe what was, a lot of what was talked about today was undergrads, and some of it may translate at the graduate level, but I'm curious to hear thoughts from others about how they've incorporated beyond the undergraduate level, so the graduate level. Mm -hmm. I, I can offer an example from my son who's a student here. Um, he's an undergrad and he's minoring in astronomy. So it's not been his focus in terms of um, the prep classes that a lot of the astronomy students take. And so he's using it actively as a tutor. Um, so, and one of the things that he found, and he's actually paying for it because he found that it was cheaper to pay for a chat GPT-4 than the free version because it gives him, um, I, I don't even know if anyone can speak to what the difference is, but somehow it's more. And one of the things he pointed out was that his instructor will teach him physics in a way that maybe ChatGPT does, you know, it's like how that, that revelation that you, math isn't just a one-way street. There's a lot of ways you can do certain things and get to the same answer. He was finding that ChatGPT as his tutor was doing it a different way than his instructor was, but he knew enough from paying attention in class what he needed to do, and it helped him sort of engage with it to figure out, you know, problem solutions based on what he knew he needed to do and what he was struggling with. So it's really interesting how he was using it as a tutor, and he found he's he's explored all the tutoring on campus. He's gone to our math and stats lab tutoring, um, but he found that he could do it day and night, and so it was a way for him to engage without having to, you know, find someone and pay someone. And it's, it's you know, so I'm I'm looking at it as tutor, 
as coach and as mentor, mm -hmm. students can ask for feedback on things like mm -hmm. papers, where it's not chat GPT writing the paper, but giving them feedback to help them improve it. Mm -hmm. um, Though as Sam pointed out, it isn't always reliable. Yeah. In yeah. the example he put up where he asked for five peer-reviewed sources, none of them were peer-reviewed. <laughs> yeah, I've been coming yes, across. I can tell either at a glance or I look one of them up. <laughs> <laughs> Stoked. A history of surfing is a mass market paper. <laughs> I want to interject something there. I know I'm supposed to shut up. <clears throat> that is, but you can you can use that fact. Oh yeah. Students, what does peer right? review mean? Now yeah. let's talk and about why these are exactly. Or here's an example. So sometimes students are given maybe they're going to peer review each other's papers, but they're we. They're nice, you know? They don't want to be mean to say your paper was terrible because blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but um, I did, in a situation, I just right there in front, I said, who's doing work? What are we going to pass out? Let's do it. Let's have Bing chat invent the paper for us. So you type it in, a paper on whatever, giving it you know parameters so that it knows it's not third grade, it's not PhD, it's supposed to be this, it's supposed to be X amount of graduation, whatever. And it's writing it right up here. And the students are looking at me like, oh. like I just said a swear word in class or something like that. That There's a kind of a secondary benefit there of showing them that we're, it's okay, we can use this as a tool. But where I'm going with this is that because it was generated by a machine, they were, they had no problem looking at it from a very critical standpoint and the kinds of things mm. that they came up with about how to make this writing better was amazing. Mm. Yeah. What you're saying right now makes me think of one of the points that Katie was making in your <coughs> presentation. I feel like the way that the writing example you gave expects that students are already strong readers and that they can evaluate writing when they read it. And because the iterative tennis volley process assumes a pretty advanced reading level as they develop their writing skills. Is that what you're finding? That students can, they can read, they, they know when they read good writing, and they can know how to continue to iteratively improve it towards better writing? Um, hmm. I, I, it's more to generate their own piece of writing that I'm using it. So, um, <coughs> for example, they have to write mission statements for pretend companies. So they know how to write a mission statement, you know, the, the instructions, but they, they, that process of going back and forth makes them clearer on the brand of their company, you know, like what kind of words they like to see. And they only, they learn that by seeing what they don't like. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's an iterative process of arriving at what they want and what represents that what they really. So they're not analyzing a piece of writing. They're they're coming up with something more in my class, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, these are sophomores, and, and it's a small class, thirty students, not yeah. five hundred. Yeah. I mean, I'm just wondering, like, why don't they stop at the first volley? But you keep telling because them because I'm there, and oh, that's why. <laughs> Well, right. really, that's the difference. That's why I said in online classes, I, I can't do that. Like, so they will stop with the first one and go, okay, well, I'm done with that. You know, ah. check that off the list. And it's like, no. <laughs> right. Not good. You're so, swinging the tennis racket. I'm, uh, I'm up in that chair. I'm up in the chair. <laughs> oh, you're the judge on the side. <laughs> Got it. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Other questions of Pam? Yeah. Uh, DJ, your, your question is, <coughs> underscores for me something that's really important here in the process, which is evaluation. Right, like we need one of the things we want to do, not just in teaching our students to ask better questions, is to evaluate the answers. Whether it's you know I looked this up in Wikipedia, or I went to the library database and I grabbed the first citation and didn't even assess whether it was peer review because I don't know what peer review is. Mm -hmm. um, that's I think a critical piece. If we're going to use this tool effectively in the classroom, evaluation has to be part of that, and they have to learn how to, whether it's evaluating good writing or the validity of the response that comes back from the, the chatbot, which, you know, because it's not a search engine, but a lot of people treat it like a search engine. Right. And so I think that's a really critical piece of how to, of that play and that process and that, um, sorry, what's the third one? Participation <laughs> um, is, is that piece, if not just, if it's all about process, then it's evaluating the entire process mm -hmm. and questioning everything and then learning how to apply that <coughs> broader like anything they see online or 
yeah. anything. It's yeah. like, how do you know that? Just how accurate is that? And they, you know, and they learn that, I mean, I don't have to keep doing that intervention. Because right. then they get that that's my expectation. Mm -hmm. So they're learning how to embody that process. They're mm -hmm. kind of learning how to expect more of what they're doing yeah. themselves, that's which awesome. is, that's the ultimate goal, right? Yeah. We're coming up on passing time. So a couple words of business. If you haven't yet signed in here, please do so. I'm happy to pass this around to anybody who needs to do that. There's one more meeting of the AI in the Classroom faculty learning community, and that's at the end of the month, another Wednesday at noon, Wednesday the 27th? Yeah, the last Wednesday of November. And uh, an RSVP will be going out, and you'd be welcome to join us for that. We have this room until 1.30, so I'd be delighted to uh, have this conversation continue uh, even after we adjourn. And I want to say one last thing, partly in response to why might someone who hasn't used AI in the classroom yet uh, come to this? I think one of the questions that came, a question that came up at a professional conference that I attended last weekend was, the challenge with the immediate sweeping integration of generative AI into our, into our culture is that it's hard to see how to opt out. Mm -hmm. So it requires a certain amount of uh, understanding and leveling up your knowledge of generative AI in order to see how to use it in your classes and how to perhaps sidestep it. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not a 100% adopter. But I do, I've, I've seen the beginning of the micro-credential, and I think it's really exciting. I think it's in a really good place. Thank you for your work on that, EJ. And the goal, I know, of that micro-credential is for all of SDSU faculty, not necessarily to be ahead of the curve, not necessarily to be immediate total adopters, but just to be at the curve <laughs> in order to be able to evaluate what's right for you and what might not be. Thank you all for coming. Please join me in thanking our presenters.